Welcome to Harry Lorraine's Memory Power, Link System and Remembering Names and Faces. Now here's your host, Harry Lorraine. Yes, I'm Harry Lorraine, and by the time I'm through with you, you'll remember it, and so much more, easily, because you already have a good memory. Sure you do. You want to prove it to yourself? Try to forget something you already know. You see what I mean? That's impossible. The more you try to forget it, the better you're going to remember it. There are only two kinds of memory. Only two kinds. There is a trained memory and there is an untrained memory. You were born with the same capacity for memory as I was. Exactly the same, except my memory is trained. Yours isn't. Even if you think you have a great memory or a fantastic memory or a good memory, I will give you a memory you never dreamed possible. And you're going to have fun as you learn and as you do. I want you to get out of that thinking rut, that rut that most of us spend our lives in. I'm going to teach you to think just a little differently, but it works. You see, I want you to have more confidence, more effectiveness, more success in everything you do. I want to give you that edge, and that edge is remembering anything you want to the very first time you see it, hear it, or read it. Now, all there is to memory, there are two things. It's all based on two things. That's association and observation. Now, I won't take the time to talk about observation, except to tell you that most of us do not observe properly. You see, observation is seeing with the mind, not with the eyes. There, there is just a little bit of difference between observation and seeing. But, you know, as you learn my trained memory systems, there is a bit of serendipity. That means a little extra without looking for it. And that is a great sense of observation, a keener sense of imagination and concentration all go along, hand in hand, automatically. Let me give you a little rule. This is the rule for all memory. In order to remember any new thing, it must be associated in some ridiculous way to something you already know and or remember. The four words there, that one phrase, in some ridiculous way, is my contribution to the rule, and quite honestly, that's what makes it work. That's what makes it workable. I will have you apply that rule in a moment. As a matter of fact, you know, I can talk about this all day, and you can nod your head and say, gee, it sounds right, but, but until you actually do something that you've never been able to do before, I don't think you're going to believe me. Well, let's see if I can get you to do something that you've met, never been able to do before. If I were to call out six or seven or eight unassociated items or objects right now, once, do you think you'd be able to remember them in sequence, forwards and backwards? If this is anything like my live seminars and lectures, I'm sure you're laughing now and saying, are you crazy? That's impossible. Well, it's not impossible. Not only is it not impossible, it's also very probable when you know how. Now, I will select six, seven, eight items, as many as we have time for. That's really immaterial. And they can represent anything. They can repre represent the appointments you have to do tomorrow, the errands you have to run, perhaps the seven or eight points of a speech or a sales talk. Any seven or eight things that you have to remember for any reason. The application is up to you. I'm interested in the method. I'm, I'm result-oriented. I want to see if you can remember these eight items and do it the way I tell you. Now, I'm going to make them up. Let's assume that the first thing you have to do tomorrow or the first item in your speech, the first thought in your speech or sales report has to do with a book. You want to remember a book. Now right now, there's no way I can help you except to tell you to visualize a familiar book. Only at first, familiarity is easier to visualize. I want you to see a book in your mind's eye. If you've done that, stop trying to think about it and let's go to the next item. The next item you have to remember for whatever reason, it's the next errand you have to do tomorrow or it's the next thought in your speech, is cigarette. Perhaps you want to talk in your speech about, oh, there'll be a section in the office that will be no smoking uh, area from now on. Or perhaps you have an errand to do that has to do with cigarettes. I don't care. Now, here's where we start to apply the rule. Remember that rule? In order to remember any new thing, it must be associated to or with something you already know and or remember. Now, the word association is something you've heard all your life, I'm sure, but it's all, always been an ephemeral, vague, twilight zone -y kind of thing. Nobody has ever really locked it in for you. Well, it's going to be locked in for you right now. It's not a twilight zone -y word at all. What the word association means is to connect, to bond two things together. I want one thing to remind you of another. Okay, so the rule is, in order to remember any new thing, 
And in this case, we will make an assumption. The new thing is cigarette. It must be associated in some ridiculous way to something we already know and or remember. And we will assume that the thing you already know or remember is the book. Therefore, we must make a silly picture in our mind's eye between or with those two items. In this case, book and cigarette. Do not make it logical. I don't want you to visualize your pack of cigarettes next to a book on your night table. That's too logical. And it is the logical, mundane, ordinary, everyday things that we all forget. It is the unusual, the obscene, the bizarre, the crazy, the impossible. Those are the things we remember anyway. Why not take advantage of that natural phenomenon? Okay, I want a silly, impossible, crazy picture, a ridiculous picture between book and cigarette. For example, you might see yourself opening a gigantic book and a million lighted cigarettes fly out and hit you in the face. Million means to see a lot of that item. That helps to make it ridiculous. Uh, you might see yourself smoking a book instead of a cigarette. Using one item instead of the other helps to make a ridiculous picture. In this case, you're using a book instead of a cigarette. You're smoking a book instead of a cigarette. You might see a gigantic book smoking a cigarette. That's kind of silly. Gigantic, seeing something larger than life helps to make it um, a silly picture and getting action in there. Perhaps that book smoking and blowing smoke rings uh, is action and that helps to make it a silly or ridiculous picture. Select one of those or one you've thought of yourself and most important, and I'm gonna keep repeating this at boredom, see that picture in your mind's eye. Actually try to see it or imagine it. That's book to cigarette and I'll give you a moment to do that. If you've tried to see that picture, stop trying now. Let's go to our next item. The next thing you want to do has to do with a shoe, or that's the next part of your talk, has to do with a shoe. Right now, we want the thing you already know and remember. In this case, it is cigarette. Stop trying to think about book now. Cigarette is the thing you already know and remember. That has to remind you of shoe. Use the same idea. You might see a gigantic uh, shoe smoking. You might see yourself wearing two lighted cigarettes on your feet instead of shoes, and it, they burn you as you walk, okay? I, you might see a gigantic cigarette wearing shoes. I can give you so many examples of each one, but all you need is one. Select one of those pictures or one you thought of yourself, which is usually better because you thought of it, and most important, see it in your mind's eye. Okay, that cigarette to shoe, do it now. If you've done that, stop thinking about it, and if I'm going too quickly, don't worry about it. Don't worry about speed, and you know that's one of the beauties of videotape, isn't it? If I'm going too fast, all you have to do is push that button on your remote control, and you can make me jump back and do it all over again. I don't think that should be necessary. You can even stop me which a lot of people would like to do. But you have the control, don't you? Okay, if you've seen that picture, stop trying to think about it. The length of time in which you see it in your mind's eye is not important. What's important is the clarity of the picture. See it clearly, and that takes just a split second, usually. Okay, the thing we already know and remember is shoe. The new thing I want you to remember now is typewriter. Make a silly picture in your mind's eye between shoe and typewriter. You might see a gigantic shoe typing. That's silly. That's ridiculous. You might see yourself wearing a typewriter on each foot instead of shoes. Actually see that picture. You might see a gigantic typewriter wearing shoes. Any one of those is good. Select one or one you thought of yourself. Most important, see it in your mind's eye. If you don't do that, it will not work. You must really see that picture. Are you working along with me? Are you trying to do this? Raise your hand if you are. Good, I know I'm not there, but I want the people with you to see that you raised your hand, and I want you to see that they raised their hand. And if you haven't been trying this, I suggest you rewind the type, uh, tape and start all over again, because if you don't try this, there's no way you're gonna know whether it works or not, will you? So do try it. If you've seen that last picture, which was shoot to typewriter, stop thinking about it, and the next thing we want to do would be, all has to do with a tree. That's the next thought of your speech, or the next thing, next errand you have to do tomorrow, has to do with a tree, the woody plant. Visualize a tree, but you must associate it to typewriter. Typewriter has to remind you of tree. How? Silly picture. For example, a million typewriters are growing on a tree instead of leaves. A tree is typing. That's silly. 
any one of those. You have gigantic typewriters growing in your garden instead of a tree. You're watering it, and as you water, it grows like a tree. Select one or one you thought of yourself and see that picture. That's the most important thing. I'm going to go a little faster now because I think you have the idea. The next thing you have to talk about in your sales report or the next thing you have to do tomorrow has to do with an envelope. Perhaps you have to order a million envelopes, whatever, okay? I want tree to remind you of envelope. Silly picture, a million envelopes are growing on a tree instead of leaves. That's all. Look, you're licking a, a tree and sealing it like an envelope. You're putting a tree into an envelope and sealing it. Any silly picture between tree and envelope. See that picture. Okay, the next thing has to do with a shirt. You have an errand that has to do with a man's uh, shirt or you want to talk about one of your products that has to do, that is a man's shirt or men's shirts. You want to associate or see a silly picture between envelope and shirt. You might see yourself using a shirt instead of an envelope. You might see yourself putting on an envelope instead of a shirt or a gigantic envelope is putting on a shirt. Any one of those is silly. Select one, see it in your mind's eye, clearly, do it now. Let's take just one more. You need to remember scissors. That's your next appointment uh, tomorrow, has something to do with scissors, and or it's part of your sales talk. Associate shirt to scissors. I want shirt to remind you of scissors. Silly picture, you're putting on a pair of scissors instead of a shirt and it's stabbing you and hurting you. Or a gigantic pair of scissors is putting on a shirt, or you're cutting one of your very expensive shirts with a gigantic scissors. That's not impossible, but it is kind of improbable and silly. Now, this is the last one we'll do, uh, do or use. Don't think that if you don't see the picture, you will remember it. I assure you, you won't. See that picture between shirt and scissors. Do it now. Have you worked along with me? Let me see a show of hands. You have? Good. If you haven't, remember what I said before, rewind the tape and do it again because I want to test you right now. I want you to amaze yourself right now if you've worked along with me because I know you still don't believe this. You don't think you know these uh, eight, I believe, items, do you, uh, the, of the appointments you want to do tomorrow or the uh, points of your speech or sales report. Well, let's see if you do. The only one you may have trouble with is the first one because I have not yet told you how to associate that. An easy way, incidentally, is to start anywhere near the top and work backwards. Where are you going to end? You have to end at the first one. Okay, if you don't know that, if you thought of it, fine. If you don't know it, I'll help you with that first one. That is book. I know you knew it. Okay, think of book for just a moment, and if you made a really silly picture between book and something else, that something else should come to mind right now. What was that book doing, or what were you doing with the book, or you opened the book and something happened, what does it remind you of? What? Cigarette, of course. Book reminds you of cigarette. Now, think of cigarette for a moment. What were you doing with that cigarette that was silly? Of course, you were smoking a shoe instead of a cigarette. Of course, I know people smoke anything nowadays, but I think we could draw the line. And shoe, I think that is a little silly. Okay, cigarette reminded you of shoe. Think of shoe for a moment. What were you doing with that shoe that was silly, or what was the shoe doing? I'm just talking to give you a little time to get it in your mind. What is it? Of course, typewriter. You, perhaps you were wearing typewriters instead of shoes, or a shoe was typing. Think of typewriter. What does typewriter remind you of? They were growing on what? On a tree, of course. I know you know that. Now, what else was growing on the tree? Think of that tree. Envelopes, exactly right. Now, think of envelope. What were you sealing in an envelope? What, what, was, what was a gigantic envelope doing? That should remind you of shirt, exactly. Think of shirt for a moment. What does that remind you of? Scissors, of course. Think of scissors for a moment. What does that remind you of? Nothing. You're absolutely right. That was our last one. Couldn't trick you. You want to amaze yourself a little more? Think of scissors. What does that remind you of? There's only one way you can go, and that's backward, and that should remind you of shirt. Think of shirt. What does that remind you, uh, you of? Envelope, of course. Do this on your own. See if you can go backwards all the way up to book. And if you want to stop tape again and try it on your own, of course, do so. Have you amazed yourself? 
You can try this on your own. You don't have to use the items I've selected. I want you to really apply it the way you would for appointments as you do it the night before. And it takes no time away from your busy life. You can do it while you're showering. Usually you plan the things you want to do the next day, the night before anyway. Do it while you're brushing your teeth as you're getting ready for bed, so on. The next morning, go over them in your mind. You'll know that we call this the link system of memory, incidentally, because you're linking one thing to another. One thing reminds you of the other, and it's based on the reminder system. That's a phenomenon, you know, that happens to all of us. You've gone through life doing this. You see something, and it makes you, it makes you do this. Oop, that reminds me. And usually the thing that made you say that had nothing to do with the thing it reminded you of. Except that somewhere in the back of your mind, there was an association between those two things. If there wasn't, it wouldn't, made you, it wouldn't have made you say, oop, that reminds me. The problem with that is it, it's hit or miss. In other words, if that association, that subconscious kind of thing was a strong association, you'd re remember it. If it was not a strong association, you would have forgotten it. I am teaching you how to do it consciously, knowingly. Once you can do that, you've got to train memory and you just did it. Okay, you do it the night before. If any new errand comes to mind or another thought of your speech, add it on to your link. The link system of memory, it's used for se sequential things. A speech is a sequence of thoughts. A sales report is a sequence of thoughts. The things you want to do the next day are sequential, except you don't have to do them in, in order. Do them any way you like the next day. And as you're walking, as you're having a cup of coffee, as you're on the bus or as you're in your limousine or driving your car, just go over your link in your mind and you will know the errands or appointments you've already accomplished. You'll know what's left to do. Just before you go home, uh, at the end of the day, go over your link. Anything you have not accomplished yet will stand out like a sore thumb, so you still have time to do it before you go home. If you can remember eight items forward and backward the way you just did, you could do it with 18. If you could do it with 18, you could do it with 28. Of course, it's going to take you a little longer to remember 28 items in sequence than it does to remember eight items in sequence, but that would be true in any case. In other words, it'll always take you longer to remember 28 items than it will eight. But applying the system cuts it all down. It makes it all so much faster, easier, and fun because you're using your imagination. You, you are pinpointing your concentration in a way that you've never been able to do before. One of the other principles this is based on is what I call original awareness. What you have to do in all areas of memory is to make information register in your mind in the first place. That's what I call original awareness, and that's what I've taught you how to do. By making that silly picture, I have forced you to grab your mind by the scruff of the neck and say to it, darn it, pay attention. That's what you've been doing. You've paid attention. You've pinpointed your, pinpointed your uh, concentration, and you have those reminders upon which all memory is based. Try this on your own. Show off to your friends. Don't tell them how you do it. Just have them call out a list and memorize it for them. I want you to have that confidence and then start using it. Use it. I, I'm trying to answer a few questions here. If you're going to ask me about the retention value here, that works automatically. In other words, if you want to remember a shopping list, and forgetting something when you go shopping is not an earth-shattering situation, I'm aware of that, but what I just taught you can be used for shopping list. If you want to buy dog food and you want that to remind you of eggs, just see yourself uh, leading a gigantic egg on a leash like a dog. That way, when you think of dog, you will automatically think of egg, don't you see? Then you run a mile down the counter in the supermarket and uh, buy the thing you want. As you're walking with your shopping cart, just go over your link. You'll know what you have left out and what you need to go and get and put it to your shopping cart. As you're waiting online to pay, go over your link. You still have a moment to run to get something that you may have forgotten. It's not an earth-shattering thing, but when you're through with that, you don't want to remember it because the next day you may have another shopping list. It works automatically. The first list will fade. But if you have memorized information with the link system that is important and that you want to remember, by the second or third time you've used it, you will know it. It's almost like an algebraic equation. Each time you use it, and the more you use it, the more those silly pictures fade. You don't need those. That's a means to an end. The means fade as you approach the end. So the more you use it, the further away those pictures fade, you won't know those anymore, and the more that information becomes knowledge. I'd like you to try this, if you will, on your own. 
this front row right away. I got a problem here. This is Mr. Kaup, Mr. and Mrs. Prasateo. Did I say it right? I think I said it better than you do. Right over here, it's Miss Russo, and this is Mr. Zukifli. I hope I said that right. Now, I see Miss Dearlove, Miss McNally, Miss Williams. I'm saying Miss for the ladies. I know there are some Misses. It's just faster to say Miss. Okay? This is Mr. Penham. This is Mr. Herman. First, you change seats. Then you took your jacket off. Then you changed. But you can't change that face. Sit down, Mr. Herman. Yes, you've seen me do that quite often on just about every national talk show in America, and I've done it in pr probably every uh, talk show uh, all over the world, uh, remembering Dutch names and German names and Japanese names. You see, it doesn't really make any difference to me. You could do the same thing, but you don't want to remember 500, 700 names as I do in, in a studio audience or at my personal corporate appearances. I do that. It's a monkey on my back, you see. I've been seen doing it for so long that it's expected of me. I've been told by, by promotion people that I have met and remembered 12 million people in my career. I could start my own country. Not that I'd want to with some of the people I've met. Truth of the matter is I try to forget uh, most of them as soon as I get the check, you know. But it's an occupational hazard. You know, I could be driving on a highway and somebody passes me at 55. Uh, they've gone 75. I'm going 55 because I'm a law-abiding citizen. And as they drive by and pass me, they yell out, What's my name? And of course, after the crack up, I tell them, <laughs> usually. In any case, you don't want to remember that many names. You can do it. I could teach you how to do it. It would be, uh, it's almost like swinging three bats to make it easier to swing one. But what you are really interested in is remembering the few people you meet during a business day, during a social day, during any kind of day or night. You want to be able to leave a party and say goodnight to people by name instead of uh, saying, uh, well, so long, uh, everybody, which is what people usually do. In order to get into names and faces, let me start with a strange little anecdote. When I wanted to remember or learn the word for clams when I was in Portugal, and that word incidentally is a mejuiz, a mejuiz is the word for clams in Portuguese. What I did in my mind is I saw a silly picture. I imagined a silly picture, which I will now tell you, but keep this in mind. Bear in mind that it takes much longer to tell you what goes on in the mind than what actually goes on in the mind. When I did it, it was a split second, but it will take longer than that to tell it to you, but I'll do it quickly. I realize, I told you before, that I speak quickly. You can always slow me down if you want to. Just push that pause button or rewind, and I'll say it all over for you. You have the control. In my mind, I saw a gigantic clam walking toward me. It had just come out of the sea. It was all filthy and dirty. Now, clam is the English equivalent of the word I wanted to remember. And as it neared me, as it came closer to me, I looked at that clam and I said, what a mess you is. I hope I made you smile. I hope I made you laugh because if I got a reaction, that's the key. That's the point that makes you think it's that slap in the face principle, which I'll explain to you in a moment. You see, all memory problems boil down to entities of two. No matter how complicated they seem at first, they are entities of two. And this is a good example, foreign language. The two entities, English equivalent, English equivalent in this case the clam, and the foreign conglomeration of sound. That's all a foreign word is. If you don't know it, it's a conglomeration of sound. Very difficult to remember. In this case, a measure is. Just those two things. What I just explained to you is the basis of what I call the substitute word system of memory. And it has to do with names, which is why I'm teaching it to you now. So I'll talk a little bit about language and then we'll go into names because you will be using the same system. If you visualized clam, and if you said to it what a meju is, what a meju is reminds you of the conglomeration of sound. There's that reminder principle again. A meju is. And of course, it was a clam that was messy. Therefore, you know the English equivalent. Had I been awakened at 4 o'clock the next morning at that time in Portugal, and somebody said, what's the Portuguese word for clam? I would have said a meju is. I wouldn't have to think about it at all. And if you make that picture, you'll know it. So the next time you're in Portugal, you can order a meju is, which are delicious in Portugal. The slap in the pa face principle, that slap in the face that I mentioned before, see Aristotle, if I'm going to drop names, I'm going to drop good ones. Aristotle wrote, wrote two books on the subject of memory and the first sentence of one of those books was, in order to think we must speculate with images. 
He knew that 3,000 years ago, and that's what I'm telling you to do now. In order to think, you must see images in your mind, and I'm teaching you that. But he was also a philosopher. So was Socrates, so was Simonides, so was Plato. They were philosophers and they were teachers, and they usually taught one person at a time, head to head. And what a man like Aristotle or Simonides or Socrates did when he made what he thought was an important point is he would slap the student in the face very hard. The concept being that the student would never forget that, and it worked. I found that in my research in history. What history doesn't record is how the students felt about that. I don't think they were too thrilled, but it did work. The only problem with that is slapping yourself in the face hurts. I'm teaching you to do it mentally, painlessly. Those silly pictures, those are the slaps in the face, okay? If you wanted to remember that the French word and this is one of the first things I did when I was a kid going to school. And that's another story, the way I got into the memory field, because I didn't want my father to belt me when I came home with bad grades, you see. And I wanted to remember that the word père, for example, means father. In French, I simply visualized a gigantic pear, the fruit, rocking a baby in its arms. The pear was being a father. That's all I had to do. If I want to remember that the word pont, means bridge, sur le pont d'Avignon, pont, the bridge of d'Avignon. I visualize myself punting. That's the closest I can get to that sound. Punting a football over a bridge. Or I was punting a bridge instead of a football. Punt reminded me of pont. And bridge is in the picture. Tells me that's what the word means. Don't you see? The word pamplemousse, if, you, if you're looking at a French menu in a restaurant, the word pamplemousse is grapefruit. Well, it's kind of a silly, really uh, silly picture, but that's the way I remembered it, and I want to be truthful uh, with you. I saw a bunch of pimples on a, on a moose. Pimple, moose. Reminds me of pamplemousse, but all those pimples were really gigantic grapefruits. Hmm, isn't that awful? But it worked. I told you, I'm very result-oriented. Now, the same thing works with any language. I don't care what language you're talking about. The word for tie in Swedish, and I know this, because I had lost my luggage when I was in Sweden, and I had to ask for certain pieces of clothing. The word for tie is sleeps. Sleeps is the way it's pronounced. I simply visualize the tie that sleeps, a tie sleeping. The word for pants, man's pants, trousers, is bixor. I'm trying to pronounce it properly for you, bixor. What does that sound like to me? And that's the basis of the substitute word system, big sore. I simply saw a gigantic pair of pants, nobody in them, just the pants, with a big saw on it, S-O-R-E. I'll leave that to your imagination, big saw. You can see a beak causing a sore on the pants, beak saw, if you like, as long as it reminds you of those two entities. Okay? The word for sock, I needed some socks, is strumpa. It's sort of an explosive sound at the end, strumpa. What I visualized is my father strumming a sock instead of a guitar. Strum, pa, my pa, my father, but he was strumming what? A sock. That reminded me that that conglomeration of sounds, strumpa, means sock. It's that simple. You can use the same thing for English vocabulary. The word omphalus means, I don't know if you know the meaning, fine, but if you don't, it means the navel, the belly button. How did I remember it? Very simple. I saw my arm fall loose. Arm fall loose. Where did it fall? Right into my belly button. See that picture? How can you possibly forget it? It's harder to forget it than to remember it. Remembering is easy. My problem is forgetting, not remembering. You See these pictures. I may test you later. I may not, but you don't know. Uh, peduncle. The word peduncle means flower stalk flower stalk. The way I originally remember that is I, I visualized this, this little story. I owed my uncle money. I paid my uncle, paid uncle, peduncle, if you say it quickly, not with money, but with flower stalks. There are those two entities. Paid uncle reminds me of the sound of the word I didn't know, peduncle. Flower stalks tells me it, its meaning. Factotum. The word factotum means handyman visualize somebody who looks like a handyman, you know, in overalls, the tools, and so forth, writing on a totem pole, writing facts on a totem pole, if you like, facts on a totem pole, fact totem, handyman is doing it, fact totem means handyman. Anchorite means hermit, the word anchorite means hermit. See yourself writing with an anchor, anchor, right, 
but you're all alone in the world. You're a hermit. See somebody that you visualize looking like a hermit, writing with an anchor. Anchor, right, and it's a hermit doing it. Do you know the word for uh, father in French? Pair, of course. What does pont mean in French? If it reminds you of punt, it'll tell you the meaning. You were punting a bridge, of course. How about the word, how do you say tie in Swedish? What was the tie doing? Sleeps, of course. What does the word strumpa mean in Swedish? What was your pa strumming? A sock, that's what it means, sock. Don't you see? Uh, what does the word omphalos mean? It's an English word. Omphalos, omphalos, where did it fall? Into your belly button, that's what it means. Kaduncle, you paid your uncle with what? What does pantlevus mean? Grapefruit, of course. I don't have to go through all of them. I know, and you know, that you know them now. And children in school use that system to remember, memorize, learn, know. All those words are synonyms to me. They, they mean the same thing. There is no learning without memory. And there is no knowledge without memory. So to know something or to remember it as your teachers word it, rather to know something or to learn it as your teachers word it, to me means go home and memorize it. Remember it. Of course, you can understand it at the same time. Understanding is important, and there is no knowledge without understanding. We all know that. Why am I teaching you this? Because a name is about the same thing. It's a conglomeration of sound. The idea is to take anything that has no meaning to you and give it meaning. We've just been doing that. What if you meet a Mr. Bentavania? Bentavania, there's a conglomeration of sound. It's what I used to call a zip name. Because when you introduce to somebody like, like that, the name goes in one ear and zips right out the other. You pay absolutely no attention because society has told you you're not going to remember it anyway. Or while you're being introduced to Mr. Bentavania, you're cruising the rest of the room trying to see who's very important to you in business. Little realizing that Mr. Bentavania may be the guy that's most important. How do you remember these names? Make it meaningful. I can't visualize Bentavania, but I can visualize a bent weather vane. You know, the thing on the roof with the N-E-W-S, northeast, west, south, and a rooster usually on top of it. See it bent. Bent vane is enough to remind you of Bentavania, if you thought of it yourself. The point being that bent vane is enough to remind you of the name Bentavania. That's that strong point I want to make. Puck Shiva is a very difficult name. These are real names that people I've met before. I couldn't even tell you the spelling. It's got a lot of C's and Z's and V's in it because it's a Polish name. And it sounds so difficult at first, but it isn't really. Visualize a hockey puck shivering because it's on ice, it's cold. You got puck, shiver. You've made it meaningful. Now it's easy to remember. Anything you can visualize is easy to remember. The problem is to visualize it, and that's what I'm teaching you right now. Any name, I don't care how difficult it is, how foreign sounding it is, how long sounding it is. Forget difficult, it isn't difficult. Demetriades is the name of a person I've met, it's a Greek name. The Meat Tree, eight E's, is what I originally saw in my mind. Sounds silly, isn't it? Good, the sillier, the better. The Meat Tree, eight E's, I saw a tree made out of meat. The meat tree, eight E's. It was eating a lot of letter E's. And then I associated that, I associated that to the person which I will be talking about in a moment. But one step at a time. The meat tree, eight E's, is easy to remember because it makes sense. It's, it has meaning, whereas the name Dimitri Eides does not. The name punch a train. Punch a train. Punch a train. I'm going to use that name again. Mangle an arrow. Mangle an arrow will remind you of mangle an arrow. Don't you see how simple it is? Throw piano. Picture yourself throwing a piano. Throw piano is enough to remind you of throw piano. Lorraine. See something that reminds you of law, like a judge's gavel. Raining. Law. Rain. Policemen represent the law. See it raining policemen. Lorraine. Don't you see how easy it is? It is so simple. But there's another problem. Just knowing a name in limbo does you no good at all. You have to know to whom that name belongs. That's what you saw me do a little earlier in, in television studios, uh, on all the talk shows or uh, at corporate appearances where I'm the keynote speaker. As I told you, I have to do that. This is what I do. I make the name meaningful and then I associate it to that person's face. Now, how do I do that? Very simple. 
What you do is you look at that person's face and you select one outstanding feature. Now, I don't care what it is. It could be, let's go from the top down. It could be the hairline, the hair. It could be these lines that I have in my forehead. We used to call these worry lines. Now they are character lines. Okay? You can use those. You can use a narrow forehead, wide forehead, uh, this way or that way. Uh, eyebrows, thin eyebrows, no eyebrows, curvy eyebrows, straight eyebrows, bushy eyebrows. Uh, eyes, wide apart, close together, large eyes or squinty eyes. Nose, large, small, crooked, uh, ski nose, uh, nostrils, wide, flaring, uh, very thin nostrils, cheeks, full or sunken, ears away from the head, close to the head, large ears, small ears, ear lobes, full or uh, shallow. Anything, uh, what have I left out? Lips, thick lips, uh, thin lips, curved lips, uh, straight, curved, uh, bow lips, uh, pretty lips, ugly lips, thick lips, narrow lips, chin, jutting, receding. Um, I think I've covered just about everything. Pimples, dimples, warts, I don't care. First impressions are lasting impressions. But there's another point here, this is very important. When you meet a Mr. Pennsylvania, and you try to apply my system, as I told you before, visualizing a bent weather vane, perhaps. What am I forcing you to do that 99.9% .9 of the people in the world do not do? Can you think of it? It's very simple. It's so obvious, maybe you won't think of it. I am forcing you to listen to that name. There is no way you can apply my system without hearing the name. You know, the way people are usually introduced is, and I'll imitate it for you, Mr. Jones, say hello to Mr. Ferguson. You hear a mumble. There's no way, to, incidentally, the reason you're usually hearing a mumble is because the introducer forgot the introducee's name, you see. So he or she has no choice but to mumble. But you can't remember a mumble. And then what you don't do is the obvious thing. Simply say, I'm sorry, I didn't hear your name. The reason, incidentally, most people, all of us, do that is, number one, we think it's embarrassing, which it isn't. You, you will flatter the person when you ask for his or her name. But the main reason is that the feeling is, oh, what the heck, I'm never going to meet that person again anyway, why bother? So you don't bother, and then, of course, you do meet that person again the next day, the next week, the next month, the next year. And that's why half the world calls the other half Buddy Mac darling sweetheart honey not because they're so endearing but because they don't know who the heck they're talking to and that's okay because the other half doesn't know who's talking to them so we all go through life with those blinkers on not knowing each other's names when it's, it's so simple and so easy to do okay to try to make up a word to remind you of the person's name forces you to listen that's half the battle you know there's a thing i've said for years even if my systems don't work they must work and this is the reason i know that's a contradictory sounding thing to say but it's true because if you simply try to apply my system it's forcing you to listen so if the systems don't work it's still going to better your memory but of course the systems do work beautifully in a great way for everybody for millions of people all over the world they'll work for you if you do what I tell you. The next thing I told you to do is to look at the face and find an outstanding feature. Well, do you hear the key word there? In order to find or locate or decide on an outstanding feature, what must you do? You must look at that face. Most people don't. We spent, go through life looking at each other's left ears. You must look at that face to find an outstanding feature, one of those that I mentioned before, anyone. Okay, you have listened, you have looked, you have made the name meaningful by using my substitute word system. You have looked at the face because you've selected an outstanding feature. What do you do now? You lock the two together the way I taught you before. You make a silly association. Let's assume you meet a Mr. Bentavania and he has a big nose. You have already thought of Bent Vein as you shake hands. That's all the time it takes. You thought of Bent Vein, you've locked in that name. And if he mumbled his name, because he's gone through life with everybody forgetting his name, and he knows you're not going to remember it, so he said, you say, I'm sorry, I didn't hear your name. You hear Bent Devania, you visualize a bent vein. Next step, while you're talking, he's got a big nose, you've looked at his face, visualize a bent weather vein on his face instead of a nose. That's all. You will make that face tell you the name, I assure you. You know, the cliché I've heard all my life is, oh, I recognize your face, but I don't know your name. I have never in my entire career heard it the other way around. I have never heard anybody say, oh, I remember your name, I don't recognize your face. I've 
never heard that. Do you know why? You know why that's a cliche? Because 99.9% .9 of the people in the world are video-minded. In other words, we remember what we see much better than those who are audio-minded who remember what they hear. You usually hear the name. Therein lies the problem. You see the face, that's why you recognize it. Well, why not take that cliche? Why not take that truth that you're going to recognize the name anyway and have that help you remember the name? That's what my system is doing. I've been teaching this for so long and I still get this emotional over it. You can soar with this idea. You really can if you apply it. You meet a, a, a Puck Shiva is a name I used a moment ago. Okay, you meet somebody with these lines that I have on the forehead, the character lines. Visualize a bunch of pucks flying out of there. I get violent sometimes because I'm a pacifist. And violence to me is the silliest thing in the world. So I see those hockey pucks flying out of those lines or the forehead, ripping that forehead apart and they're all shivering because they're cold. Puck, shiver. You've locked in the two things, the substitute word for the name and that face. <clears throat> That's all there is to it. Again, I could talk about this from today till tomorrow, but until you actually try it yourself, you're not going to believe that this works. So let's try it. I'm, you're at a group affair. You're at a meeting. You're at a business meeting in the morning. You're going to meet six new people. I will introduce them to you. I will tell you their names. I will show you how I would go about remembering them. I want you to work along with me. Will you? <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's take the first person. Look at his face. This is Mr. Carruthers. Mr. Carruthers. Pick out an outstanding feature. You know what my eye went to first? That cleft in the chin. Also, look at the hairline, sort of triangular, widow's peak type of um, hairline. Straight lips. Select any one you like, but lock it in. The one that hits you first is the most important. Now, you've done that, but you haven't done anything with Carruthers yet. Let me help you on that. Car utters. Carruthers. You know what I visualized? I visualized a car having udders like a cow. Car udders, and I'm milking the car. Car udders. Let's tie that to this person's face. What I just did is I saw a gigantic car coming out of that cleft, again, ripping it apart. The car has very obvious udders, and somebody is milking it. The car, just to remind you that those are udders. Car udder, car udders, Carruthers. Look at the face, see that picture. Do it now, really see that picture. Okay, you've just met Mr. Carruthers, now you're gonna be introduced to Miss Fleming. I want you to look at Miss Fleming. You've just been introdu introduced. Pick an outstanding feature. Look at the long hair if you like. I know that hair could be cut the next time you meet uh, this lady whose name is Miss Fleming, incidentally. She may have cut her hair, but that's okay. Once it's locked in, it doesn't matter. Look at the good character lines from nose to corners of mouth. Look at that good, strong chin. And if you look real close, you can see a philtrum. That's called a philtrum. That's that indentation from center of nose to center of top lip. You select what you see, the outstanding feature, and tie Fleming to that. How do you do that? Fleming, flaming. I just looked at those good lines from uh, nostrils to corners of mouth that I see flames shooting out of that. They are flaming. Flaming will remind me of Fleming. See that picture. Okay, now I'm going to introduce you to Mr. Puncher Train. This is Mr. Puncher Train. I mentioned that name before. Puncher Train, I told you, Puncher Train. Isn't that obvious now? Look at his face. Look at that great high forehead. Look at the mustache or beard. Again, sure, he can shave those. It doesn't matter. Take my word for it, it'll still work. If you want to use a mustache, mustache or beard, do it. Because don't you see, you're focusing your attention again. It doesn't really matter. I just looked at that high forehead and I see a train coming out of that fo high forehead toward me and I punch it, punch a train. That's all I have to do with Mr. Poncha Train. See the picture, you must see the picture. Okay, let me introduce you to somebody else. Now I'm gonna introduce you to Mr. Witherspoon. This is Mr. Witherspoon. Good small mouth, look at the ear, tiny ears, good straight hairline, high forehead again, and you can use a high forehead a few times, doesn't matter, each person is different. Select what you think is an outstanding feature. Now this is an individual thing. I'm throwing in important points as they come to me. 
We all think differently, we see differently, and that's the way it should be. We are all unique. What I see on that person's face may not be outstanding to you. What you see may not be outstanding to the other person. That's immaterial. What's outstanding to you is. So select one thing. His name is Witherspoon. Can you see a spoon just withering away, falling apart? Okay, I took a look at that little ear, and I see a spoon coming out of that ear, and it's withering away. That's Mr. Witherspoon. See that picture. Now I want to introduce you to Miss Chorofsky. This is Miss Chorofsky. Let's break that down first. Chair of Ski. Chorofsky. C H E R O F S K I. You can see a sheriff skiing. Sheriffsky. I just broke that accent a little bit. It's enough to remind me of Chorofsky. Sheriffsky. Chorofsky. Or you can see a chair falling off a ski chair off ski suddenly that name is not that difficult anymore is it chair off ski is not difficult to visualize you can see a chair falling off a ski it's a silly picture that's fine that's what i want use whichever you like look at that face look at those good high cheekbones the hairline if you like the lips again good lines from uh quarters of nostrils to quarters of mouth select whatever you like i'm using those high cheekbones and i see sheriffs skiing out of those cheekbone, cheekbones. Sheriff Ski, if you want to use chair off ski, see chairs skiing out of those cheekbones, ripping them apart, but the, they fall off. The chairs fall off the skis. Chair off ski. Really see that picture. Now, finally, I'd like you to meet Mr. Smith. Say hello to Mr. Smith. Look at those good full cheeks. Look at the good dimples, good strong chin, high forehead. Be careful of a name like Smith. Smith, Jones, the obvious kind of names, the simple seeming names are the ones you're going to forget. You know why? The attitude is, oh, how can I forget Smith? And then you do, because you pay no attention. So be very careful. I use a standard picture in my mind for the name Smith. I use standards for a lot of names, and I'll talk about that after you remember all these names. But one of my standards is a blacksmith's hammer. I always visualize a blacksmith's hammer to remind me of Smith or Smythe or Schmidt. True memory will tell me the difference, and we all have that great memory to begin with, okay? Right now, I look at those full cheeks, and I visualize a blacksmith's hammer pounding those cheeks. That's what made them puff up and be that full in the first place. That's the picture I used. You use any picture you like, use any outstanding feature you like, and get a blacksmith's hammer in there. See that picture. You have just met six people. Now we are all going out for a coffee break. Coffee break is over. Everybody's had their coffee. You finished yours first. You're already in the meeting room. Here come the other people, those six people you just met. They're not going to come back in the same order in which you met them. Obviously, that's not real life if I, if I showed you the people in the same order. So they're going to be in a mixed order. Here they come. Here's the first person walking into the room. Look at that face. That name should come to you immediately because what you used as an outstanding feature before should strike you now, should impress you now. I use the high cheekbones. I don't know what you used, and that's immaterial. It doesn't matter. That's what you're looking at now. What was coming out of those cheekbones or whatever? What was happening? What is this lady's name? Is it Miss, say it, Chorofsky, Sheriffsky, Chair Ofsky. That is Miss Chorofsky. Let's look at the next person walking in behind Miss Chorofsky. Look at that face. That cleft is the most obvious thing to me. That's what I looked at. But you may have used that triangular um, hairdo or that triangular piece of forehead, straight lips, whatever. What was happening? Think about it for a second. And what is that person's name? I'm sure you already know it, and that's why I'm talking. I don't want to say it before you think of it. I don't want you to think you forgot it when you really didn't. It's just that I said it too soon. I saw a car coming out of that cleft, and it had others. Mr. Carruthers. That simple. Okay, here comes the next person following Mr. Carruthers. Look at that face. Look at those full cheeks. I told you, be careful of these kinds of names. Did it come to you? What is this gentleman's name? Of course, this is Mr. Smith. Let's meet the next person coming in. Now look, look at that good chin. Look at those good lines from nose to corners of uh, mouth. That, that philtrum, if you can see it. What was happening? I used those lines. What was happening there? They were burning, they were flaming. And that tells you that this lady's name is 
Miss Fleming, of course, that is Miss Fleming. Here comes another person, one of the six. Look at the face. The ear is what I looked at, the small ears. Remember, please, that these are, what, one-dimensional figures. When you see people like this in real life, I, you would see both ears, wouldn't you? You're going to see third-dimensional people. You would see the full body. You would get more of a picture of the entire person, which, of course, helps. This is the hard way, but it's still going to work. Look at the straight hairline. Look at the ear. I don't know which you used. I used the ear. What was happening? Of course, a big spoon was coming out and it was withering. That is Mr. Witherspoon. Here comes another person. The last of the six. Look at that face. Look at the high forehead. That's what I used. What was happening? Think about it for a moment. There was a what coming out of his forehead and what were you doing to that what? It was a train which you were punching, Mr. Puncher Train or Puncher Train. That is Mr. Puncher Train. Did you convince yourself? Are you amazed at yourself? You know, we only had time to do it with six people. The, you know, I'm always asked when I'm on the, the, any of the talk shows, the Tonight Show or the Merv Griffin Show that I used to do very often, or the Mike Douglas Show, going back to the Jack Parr Show and the Ed Sullivan Show. Uh, I was always asked, how long will you remember these people? And I also was asked, how many people did you meet, you know, before the show went on? My answer to the last question, how many people did you meet, I always said, I don't know. I don't count them. What scared the heck out of me? I don't care how many people there are because each person, when I meet groups of people, each person is an entity. At that moment, when I am hearing that person's name and looking at that person's face, nobody else in the world exists as far as I'm concerned. Each person is an entity. That's how it's done. The longest journey starts with the first step, if you'll forgive a sort of corroded cliche or platitude. One person at a time. That's all it, that exists to me at that moment. So don't worry about how many people. That other question I mentioned, how long do I remember the names? I mentioned that way at the beginning of this tape, didn't I? I, uh, I said about the guy passing me and yelling out, what's my name? I usually remember the names, but the, what I answer half facetiously usually is when I get the check for this show, I forget all these names. That's only half facetious because I had to set a point in my mind years ago, what do I want to remember? When do I want to forget? It's almost automatic for me now because I don't usually see those people ever again. What's the point of having them run through my mind? But the way my systems work, if I see the face again, the name would come to mind. And that what, that's what will happen to you too. Now, I mentioned a moment ago that I use certain standards. Well, I told you about Smith. I use a blacksmith's hammer. For Cohen, I would picture an ice cream cone. Cone, Cohen. For Gordon, I picture a garden. So it's that kind of concept that will happen automatically. When you apply my systems, when you start hearing the same names over and over again, you'll start seeing the same pictures or substitute words or thoughts for those names. They automatically become standards. I even have standards for the uh, prefix prefixes and suffixes, like for Berg, which could be in front of a name or at the end of a name, right? Bergstein, Steinberg. Well, the word Berg in German means mountain. I know that, therefore I picture a mountain to remind me of Berg. If you don't know that, picture an iceberg. Don't you see how simple it is? And I said Stein just now. Well, a beer Stein will do it. The suffix Lee, L-Y. I picture a meadow because one of the a word for meadow is Lee, L-E-A. I picture a meadow for Lee. You want to use the lease? Do it. It's enough to remind you of Lee. What else? Sun is the ending of many names. Car, son. Picture a car and a smaller version of that car. It's the car's son. Anything smaller. That's what I do in my mind. Uh, G-E-R ending. Gur. Picture a lying. Gur. Picture a cigar. Gar sound will remind me of that. Wits or its. Picture brains. Wits. Or itch, if you prefer, for its. So you see, you can take any of these sounds and make them meaningful in your mind and use them as standards. After a while, they become standards. What do you do with first names? Exactly the same as what you did with last names. If you were in a group where you were, want to remember the given name and not the surname, well, how would I remember Harry? Picture that person being hairy. Whatever outstanding feature you've selected, big nose, see it covered with hair. Harry, Harry. That's all there is to it. Denise, picture the niece, opposite of nephew and associated to the outstanding uh, feature. Uh, glory, you know what I picture for Gloria? An American flag. Why? Old glory, glory, Gloria. 
Jim, picture a guy lifting weights because you usually do that in a gym. Bill, picture a dollar bill. I don't care what you use as long as it reminds you of the name. You can use the same thing if you meet a doctor. How would you remember to call this man doctor instead of mister or that lady doctor instead of miss? Get a, something into your picture that represents doctor to you. I use a stethoscope. What else? If I have a stethoscope in my picture, then I know it's doctor. If I met a Dr. Gordon with a very high forehead, I'd see that high forehead being a garden. What's growing in that garden? Stethoscopes. That's all. I've got all the information I need. It's when I see that face again, I see that high forehead. I see the stethoscopes. I see a garden. It's Dr. Gordon. All you need is a reminder. And please, don't be saying to me now, if I were there, you would ask me questions something like, yeah, but wait a minute. What if I meet a Mr. Rob Rum, for example? Why won't I call him Rum Rob when I meet him again? You know why? True memory won't let you do that. You'll know it's Rob Rum. And I got a hot flash for you. If you meet Mr. Rob Rum, and you meet him a couple of weeks later, and you call him Mr. Rum Rob, he's still going to be happy because you didn't call him Hey, which is what you usually do anyway. You know what my attitude would be? How dare you assume that you will do that? Why do you assume you will do that? Of course you'll know the right name, I told you. True memory will tell you that. The only people that ask me questions like that are people like you who have never tried it. Because if you try it, you know that can't possibly happen. I'm the one that started those jokes in the first place. In a book I wrote way back in 19, it came out in 1956, I wrote it in 1954, I was only three years old. <laughs> I laughed along with your silly, or oh, sneaky laugh. I said in that book, there was an anecdote in that book, anecdote about uh, a guy who was bragging about the fact that he uh, took my course, he, he learned my systems of memory, and one day he met a uh, uh, Mrs. Um, Hummock, Mrs. Hummock. She had a big stomach. He said, terrific, that's it. I'll just visualize stomach and I'll remember Mrs. Hummock. So that's what he did, which is not my system, really. I work with the face. In any case, that's what he did. Otherwise, the anecdote doesn't work. A week later, coming down the street, here comes that same lady. And as he passed her, he tipped his hat and he said, good to see you, Mrs. Kelly, because he thought of belly. You see, I invented those jokes in the first place. They come back to haunt me. That never happens. It's just a joke. You see, all you got to do is try it, and you'll see that it never happens. The next time you're with a group, any group, group meaning six, seven, eight, ten people, try what I just taught you. Try it as you're introduced, as you introduce the people. A, go a good point that you ought to keep in mind, when you go to a party or a meeting, usually there's a host, usually there's somebody that does the introducing. And that's one of the problems in our way of life, in our social life. Uh, people introduce you too quickly. How in the world do you have time to remember anybody if they say, uh, hey, Harry, meet Mr. Jones, Mr. Smith, Mrs. Gordon, Mr. Too fast. Here's a tip for you. When you go to a party or a meeting, say to the host or hostess, listen, you're very busy. Why don't you go ahead and do what you have to do? I'll introduce myself. Then you can do it at your own time, don't you see? Then you make these associations, and as the evening or morning or meeting goes on, every time you look at one of those faces to which you have applied my system, that name should come to mind. That's your review. That is a review. And if it's a party or a meeting, and if the name doesn't come to mind after a while, don't feel bad about approaching that person and saying, I'm sorry, would you pronounce your name for me again? And then lock it in. There is nothing wrong with that. I told you, you'll flatter the person because you're interested. That's your review, and I assure you that when you leave that room, you'll know everybody's name. Listen, I'll make a very strong guarantee, okay? I guarantee that the next time you try the systems I've just taught you, as far as names and faces are concerned, you will remember 100% more names and faces than you ever did before. The second time you try it, you'll remember, uh, well, let's put it this way, you'll remember 50% more the first time, you'll remember 75% more the next time, the third time you'll remember that 100%. I guarantee it.